Hey, and thanks for joining us for another episode of The Residence Podcast, a space where we let the community from the Pervasive Media Studio share a bit about themselves and what the space is really like. We're about to get into the Fuzzy Logic episode. Today, we meet residents for whom mental health is either a key part of their work or is part of their daily experience. You'll hear that it's pretty impossible to distinguish between the two. We really dig into the culture of the Pervasive Media Studio, sharing some reflections on how the studio has helped them develop both professionally and personally. Hey, and welcome to the Fuzzy Logic episode of the Residence Podcast. I'm your host, Will Taylor, and I'm joined here by Barney Haywood, Chloe Minek, and Victoria Melody. And we are just going to be chopping it up about ourselves, about the PM studio, and about the sort of things that um, inspire the work that we all do. I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with you all. So it's only right for our guests to introduce themselves and big themselves up as we're larger than life out here, baby. Mm -hmm. I'm Barney. I'm an artist and a designer. And I uh, run a company called Stand and Stare. And we have been residents at the Pervasive Media Studio for... I was looking back and I think it might even be around 10 years now, which feels kind of incredible we make work that's kind of interactive design and kind of plays around with the relationship between physical and digital things in all sorts of ways um my name is victoria melody and i write and perform in theater shows that are about britain's lesser knowing subcultures And I am an artist and a stand-up comedian now. And I have been a resident at Watershed for a couple of years. I can't remember exactly how many, but I came on because I was part of their winter residency scheme. I was very lucky to get selected for that. So that's how I got involved. I'm Chloe Minek. I'm a designer. I'm interested in social change, systems, society, how you can make things better, basically. I run a company or did run a company called Studio Minec um, that specialised in co-design. And then over the pandemic, I got a job redesigning government services. So I'm not really sure how to introduce myself at the minute. But yeah, I'm sure I'll get there. (laughs) Bless you, Chloe. Thank you all for being here, man. Really glad to be sort of in this situation with you all, like chatting about whatever it is we're going to chat about. So, I mean, like everyone's got varying relationships with the PM Studio. In in my experience with the PM Studio, a lot of it's been around co-creation, actually. I've never understood the PM Studio to not be a place about co-creation. It's interesting to hear you talk about Studio Manic, Chloe, and, and that it specialises in, in co-creation. And I was just wondering, sort of like, how you view co-creation or what what you see when you see a lack of it. Do you know what I'm saying? In, in the spaces that you work in. I guess what, when there's a lack of making with people, you base things on your assumption. You normally get it wrong. Uh, so you could design or make something that doesn't really um, do what it's meant to do for the community or people it's meant to be for. That's the interesting thing. Like. I'm I'm coming from a real naive perspective actually at the moment because so much of the work that I do, co-creation runs through it that I don't actually understand how work exists without that. Do you know what I'm saying? So I was just I was just wondering sort of what your experience in, in the work you've gone on to do or did for your relationship with the work that you had been doing before. Yeah, I guess I've appreciated how innovative my work was. I didn't really understand when you're actually doing your work. And I guess it's still quite early on in like designing services and systems to work with people. Right. And, and Victoria, you were mentioning, you mentioned that you're now a stand up comedian. Yeah. So I only really did it for research because I'm a bit like an anthropologist where I'll embed myself into Britain's subcultures and become different things. Like in the past, I've been a pigeon fancier, a northern soul dancer, a funeral director a championship dog show handler, a beauty queen, and now a stand-up comedian. Like, the other things, and I do it for a long time. Like, I, I, I normally embed myself into a community for around four years. and But the stand-up 
comedy one because of the pandemic I can't, I couldn't do theatre or a lot of other things that I do in 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 the community but I could carry on writing and doing online gigs so now I I this time I've actually they call it going native when an anthropologist like just sticks you know doing that thing and so now um yeah I've stopped doing it and it's getting better I was terrible I was the worst comedian ever it was so <laughs> painful I kept on doing it and my friends and husband were like please stop <laughs> I, but, but now now people are laughing so I've improved <laughs> Uh, that's dope, man. Whoever whoever starts off at the top as well, man. It's not about that, is it? Really? No, it's really good to be bad at things and not to be scared of being bad at things. Uh, can we can we have a can we have a minute for that little bit of wisdom from Victoria just there? It's good to be scared. It's good to be. Was it to, to be not bad be, at things? Yeah, to be bad at yeah. things and not be scared of doing them. Yeah, but can I can I ask you another question about around that as well? Like, do you find there's an element of co-creation in stand-up comedy? So, like, I'm not sure I know what co-creation means. Is it is is it a special buzzword, or does it basically mean collaboration? I, I'm gonna let Chloe answer that question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Will, you could answer as well. Um, yeah, where you make things with people. Yeah, you could collaborate with one or two people, but you could co-create with a whole community. Mm. or a whole yeah group of people mm, mm. Yeah, i guess I it's collaboration isn't it will yeah there's collaboration what do you reckon there. yeah most deaf most deaf is in there i think what i understand co-creation to be is that the proposed like audience has been part of the process of making it mm. yeah i guess that's why i asked the question victoria around stand-up comedy because like you got to try your material out, don't you? Do you mm. know what I'm saying? And I guess there's no better binary feedback than people either laughing or being silent. Yeah, exactly. So definitely in my theatre, my theatre stuff is very collaborative. Like my creative practice is very collaborative. But my stand-up comedy, the material itself isn't made in a collaborative way. But then, as you say, it, it like I put it in front of an audience and if it dies three times, then I'm not telling that joke again. <laughs> so it's like the audience are kind of collaborating with me to kind of write my material. Like, what am I going to do next? Like, what am I going to continue doing? And what am I never going to do again? Because it was horrendous. It's kind of like Room 101, isn't it? <laughs> Bring something out and everyone's yeah. like, I'll take it while I leave it. But there is a beauty to stand up because there's an immediacy to it. So normally when I do a theatre show, there's a two, you know, at least a day get in and loads of, you know, booking the tour in advance, a year in advance and loads of prep. Whereas stand up, you just rock up, you tell your jokes, some of them work or they don't work. And um, that's it. You know, there's, it's so easy and immediate and adaptable. You can just change it night to night. And Barney, in, in relation to what Stan and Stair do, was co-creation something that you had identified at the inception or was it something that you sort of came to learn you were doing through that work? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess co-creation has always been a really important part of our uh, process of making things and I suppose from the beginning of working at the pervasive media studio that's very much ingrained when you think about it I think it just makes sense that if you're gonna make something for somebody it kind of involves them in the process because they're the best people to tell you whether it's gonna work or not if you don't have that kind of direct experience with whatever it is how could you know what the right solution is it can be a challenging process as well when you've got the constraints of like time scales and budgets and those sorts of things so yeah it's it's a it's a definitely something that I, I think in any process is helpful again listening to you think a penny sort of dropped for me well, two did actually. I'm out here like collecting change. <laughs> the first thing was that when you was talking about sort of like co-creation, I was like, it's like making a meal for someone and not asking if they've got any allergies. Exactly. Yeah. I was also thinking like, uh, Barney, whilst you were talking about like the the co-creative element to our work as well, like, and I was wondering how you lot approach your work or how you sort of have a top down view of your work because I'm at a point now where I'm happy to like flip stuff real quick. 
in the film industry, they call it murdering your darlings. Mm. And I'm, I'm finding I have less and less darlings to murder. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like a little bit like, mm, is there something wrong with me? But then I also appreciate that I'm now doing all of my work as research. I'm learning something about me if I'm not learning something about the process that I'm going through, do you know what I'm saying, to deliver the work. So I was wondering how you lot approach the project delivery element of the jobs that you are doing or have done. I think it sort of depends on, in a way, who it's for. When we're doing work that's kind of commercial type job, it's much harder to change your idea once you've given them a budget you've given them a concept there's a delivery date whereas when we've done work which is kind of academic research or kind of working on sort of more open-ended things then that's where you kind of need to make the most I suppose of the opportunity to kind of explore ideas I think what we've always tried to do is to take those experiences so that we can then go into those kind of more commercial jobs with an understanding of like does it work or who's it for so that can be a bit more confident about how things can can kind of come together um i've sort of i've got a manifesto and although i don't read it like every time i get offered a commission or something i don't get the manifesto out i do look at it every few years and sort of update it but it's pretty much stayed the same you know, does it facilitate conversations between people that wouldn't normally speak to one another? Like that's that's got to be something for me. Does it shine a light on a group of people that we don't know much about and they don't mind that light being sh- shone upon them? You know, just it's kind of just things like that I think about it each time. And if it doesn't kind of measure up, the commission doesn't measure up to those things, then... I have to think twice about taking it. But then also sometimes I'm just a bit skint. So (laughs) I'll do anything. (laughs) She ain't lying. (laughs) But but then I'll try and sway it towards my manifesto. Because if anyone wants to work with me, they kind of know the style of what they're going to get. So um, I'm going to bend the rules to make it the way I want to make it. Um, I normally normally think about projects quite a lot before I start doing them. So if an idea, I've had it for a while and I keep coming back to it. So like a men's mental health project. I think I thought about it for two years, started chatting to people that might be collaborators for a while. And then I applied for some funding to support the process that I wanted to do. I don't normally apply for commissions. It's more I apply for funding so I can do it in my own way. But again... Sometimes I haven't got that much money. So, yeah. It all boils down to them pounds and pennies, doesn't it? Um, I'm kind of interested in the sort of role the PM Studio played in terms of offering the space for you to sort of explore the different ways you could achieve the work you wanted to achieve. I found personally that I, I wasn't necessarily aware of non-linear routes into the stuff that I'm doing now. You're taught that this is pretty much straight and narrow. And, and if you haven't achieved this, then achieving that isn't possible. Our relationship with the studio has been kind of fundamental, really, to our whole business and the way we approach it. I guess, like, before we joined 10 years ago or so, we kind of started playing around with theatre and performance and kind of interactive experiences and kind of knew what we wanted to do but couldn't quite place it. I come from a kind of art and design background and I work with my sister Lucy um, and we started the company and she's a writer and researcher and so we were kind of interested in theatre but didn't really want to perform ourselves. Our kind of I suppose entry into the studio was thinking about how do you how do you create an experience that's kind of maybe has qualities of theatre or or performance but without actors and how can technology kind of supplement some of those things the first project we did was called theater jukebox which was um a kind of arcade style booth with a table and a series of postcards and the table would recognize the postcard you've chosen and then tell you a little story through audio and then projections that are kind of mapped so they kind of interact with that physical image And it was sort of like this, suddenly this platform that we could use to kind of do things that we wanted 
that we were kind of playing around with in theatre but suddenly opened up a whole load of possibilities and a completely different audience outside of just the theatre world it was suddenly there were museums and all sorts of people that were kind of interested in that as a concept and in a way it feels like we've sort of just taken that idea and morphed it and worked with it and that's evolved into completely new things but it sort of stemmed from that I suppose and for us it's not technology for its own sake and actually the technology is often not the most interesting bit it's the ideas around that or it's the narrative I suppose even though spending less time in the studio more recently still feels like being part of that community and having that network of people and resources to sort of give you the confidence to take things forwards is really reassuring from the point of view of a small company. Yeah I mean PM Studio has been massive that's why I moved to Bristol. I was in Brighton trying to bodge some electronics together to make an <laughs> electronic product. Didn't really know what I was doing, so I decided to um, move to Bristol. And I moved because they were the most supportive people at the time. So I just thought, I'll just move to the people that seemed most supportive. For me and my partner, we both developed our practices. I mean, I've, I definitely know what I miss from the studio because I haven't been there for like two years since the pandemic. Um, it's all the support. If your project's not going great, there'll be someone in the studio that's just had good news. So there's always this kind of up and down. And also I find it a place that is somewhere you can return to. Like I've had a few things that I'm like, oh, this is my break. <laughs> I'm gonna set up my own studio. I'm gonna <laughs> get investment in my company. Uh, I'm gonna have a completely different life and then it doesn't quite work out or I take a different path and yeah somewhere I can come back to, which is really great. It's, it's just so unusual and such a rare place. Like, I live in between Brighton and London, and you would definitely think there'd be somewhere like the studio in one, you know, in London or Brighton, but there isn't. It's such, um, like, a special resource. You're very lucky to live in Bristol. If it, if it was in London or Brighton, I'd be there every day. You'd have to pay for it. I remember I, that's where I lived in Brighton. I was trying to look for places that could support me or places I could work from. And yeah, you go to the art organisation. So like, yeah, you can have a desk here, pay 400 quid a month. Uh, <laughs> how am I going to afford that? And I've also been, um, I have tried to kind of join different community initiatives in different places. And okay, yeah, you do get the, the desk space. And um, you get to work in a nice building that isn't at your home, but you don't have the community. And that's the biggie, isn't it, uh, uh, PM Studio? I really like that um, you can interrupt anybody rule. You, you can, what is it? You can take five minutes of anybody's time. Because not only is that really generous for people to give you that time, it sort of breaks you out of your, like, tunnel vision when you're making work to to speak to somebody and kind of go oh my god yeah human interaction <laughs> let's have a chat about art and yeah i think with people as well who kind of they know where you're coming from if you really need some kind of honest quality feedback about something it's a place that you can you can get it which isn't isn't always yeah easy to come by <laughs> but also you you can ignore everyone's advice like pretty much every single person in the whole of um the studio said don't work with e e an e e g headset and i was like i'm just gonna do it and they're like it's not it's not accurate and i'm like i just i need to find out for myself and so that you don't have to listen <laughs> <laughs> That's word, that's word, man. More wisdom, more wisdom there as well. Victoria, I actually wanted to check in with you about something as well, because like, previously, like, we both delivered workshops with Wright. Um, I was just really interested in your, your journey into discovering you had ADHD and how that's influenced your work now. It was, gr it was brilliant to find out that I had it because it meant that I could manage the symptoms. So I know now I need eight or nine hours of sleep and I have to like go to extremes to get that sleep. Like I will sleep in a kitchen if it is, you know, <laughs> the best place for me to sleep. I, I, so 
before I'd get more stressed out and I was so disorganized and um, forgetful because I was tired. I wasn't getting the right amount of sleep. I've realized I, um, I just need strategies to remember things. So like I have a book of lists and um and I'm just super super kind of organized now and I really prioritize my health like I eat fish oil sorry vegans and fish (laughs) um and I eat very healthily and I don't drink too much and stuff like that anymore and and so because of that I'm more productive than I've ever been it used to really stress me out if I'd have um, commissions or projects running at the same time but now I, I can manage it. You know, when you see um, cartoons, it's like loads of cats fighting in a big kind of, <laughs> oh, like a big circle together. They're like all these cats, like tails and fighting faces. And that's what it's like inside my brain. <laughs> and, and so it's been a real relief and lovely thing to get sort of semi-organised. But what um, has also come out of working is the importance of play and getting out of away from your laptop and going outside and doing some roller skating, you know, just doing some like spontaneously pointless activity. Yeah. And so it's less about my work hasn't changed, but my the way that I approach Make, approach making it has changed i am like a much happier more organized person yeah well, that's 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 amazing to hear man because um usually the rhetoric around it is led towards you thinking about how like mental health of audiences do you know what i'm saying not necessarily of the of the producers or, or the artists themselves i guess with the mental health of the artist is referred to in sort of passing you know after the fact um as opposed to being part of their experience of creating the work you know and 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 i I just always think it's really really important to sort of share that share that type of stuff wherever we can Mm. so i'm I'm a big fan of the way you go about doing that if i'm gonna be real with you Um, oh that's good i also think it's important to sort of be really upfront and honest and bold about um, you, about asking for things or doing things. So I move a lot. They put a little camera on my head, and I I I'm moving constantly, and so I need to move. And so I'll say in a meeting now, listen, I've got ADHD. I'm going to go over it in the corner and lunge now and again or you know I might need to walk over here or lie down over here and I think earlier on in your career when you're kind of younger and starting out you're a bit more afraid to ask for those things but like we've got brilliant brains and so if it means our brain can work better if we're upside down on a chair then people should be okay with facilitating that (laughs) I like the sound of that already, man. Yeah, I, I guess like Chloe as well, like because I, I first came across your work through Music Memory Box. It's as soon as I as I experienced it, I was like, the moments this piece of kit can create are just the most beautiful thing. Do you know what I'm saying? But also, sort of getting to that point requires building relationships with the people you're co-creating with. That can be quite challenging as well. Um, And I was just, yeah, wondering what some of your reflections were about that project for yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's a nine-year project. I mean, my mental health has definitely been challenged by Music Memory Box. Although the project, this is what's funny, not funny, but like (laughs) sometimes when you're doing projects that help other people, they're normally more difficult to get out the door, difficult to get funding for. So during the process of that, it takes its own sort of toll on the creator. I think that's like community work as well. I look back on some videos of families that I've worked with and seeing like the joy it brings. So there's so many good bits, but that process of how you actually get a product manufactured, it's a, it's a big one. Well, 
I don't know about you, but this episode really spoke to me, man. I know we spoke about the studio being an interruptible space, but the community is so large, it's challenging to get these real intimate moments with everyone. But one thing that stood out for me about this combo was hope and commitment. Like, really allowing yourself to be in the present, doing whatever you can to bring joy to others and being proud of that and the privilege of being able to reflect on it afterwards. I got a real sense of gentle resilience from our guests. Next up, we've got the moral quandary section, our little game where we explore the little cheeky monkey and us all waiting to be called into the limelight. So the way this works is that we have four topics from our guests to choose from. They'll read out a question from the topic of choice and offer their answer. The group can deliberate or offer their own answers too. We've also added a wild card to this series so they can answer a question not immediately related to the topics we've provided. There are no right or wrong answers or winners or losers, just masters of mayhem. Hit us up on social media to share some of your responses to the questions asked. So, Victoria is up first, and she picked a question from the culture category. Let's go. How do we feel, gang? We feeling good? Yeah, Woo! excited. Feeling good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> love that, love that. <laughs> Victoria, before you answer this question, I have to ask you what your favourite cultural activity is. Ooh. Um... Watching telly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's cultural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is 100. It is 100. It, it slightly changes the dynamic of this question now. Oh, no. Do you want um, to say something else? <laughs> no, 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 no. I would love to see where this goes because now I'm having to think on my feet. I could say going to an exhibition instead. <laughs> Do you know what? Hold that. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> once, once you see the question, right, there you go. Okay, every time you go to your favourite cultural activity, you're to lead the audience in a sing-along. Would you do it or give up that activity? If you choose to do so, which song would you pick? So, I mean, I watch television with my husband a lot. And I would definitely encourage him to sing along <laughs> with me. Uh, he's the opposite to me. He's very shy and he's got a normal job. Um, I like to think I'm refreshing. <laughs> 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 I, um, so I would um, definitely get him to sing a song with me i'd get him to sing bananas in pajamas <laughs> coming down the stairs <laughs> bananas yeah. in pajamas coming down the stairs I I can't even, that. that's my surname is melody you can tell can't you <laughs> it's a long line of wonderful singers <laughs> um amazing so we have got bananas in pajamas or pajamas and bananas uh coming live from Victoria's living room every <laughs> every time she watches TV. All right, sick. Let's go with Barney. Which topic tickles your fancy? Uh, let's go with tech. Tech. All right, let's go with this one. Would you rather live in virtual reality where you are all powerful or live in the real world and be able to go anywhere but not be able to interact with anyone or anything. Right. So if I live in re virtual reality, does that mean I can't live in the real world at all? Pretty much. That's yep. kind of one or the other. It's like... Yeah. Well, there is, there's quite kind of arguments for both, really. Um, I think my, when I first read it, I was like, I don't know if I, 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 I need to be in the real world if I could interact with people or I could interact with like nature and kind of that would be okay. But if I can't interact with either of those things, I've just got to sort of sit in a, I guess I'd have to go for virtual reality then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I guess it's a hard choice. Um, maybe that is the future of, um, Facebook has got anything to do with it. <laughs> oh, the metaverse. 
<laughs> the metaverse, yeah. What would you do? Oh, wow. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, on the day you have asked me, Barney, um, I'm actually really in the in a bit of a Casper the Ghost jam right now. I'm feeling that kind of vibe. So I think I'd be all right to sort of be in the real world and not be able to interact with everything. That's how I'm answering the question right now. Mm. Um, I find it, I don't know, I just sort of like see myself at the top of a mountain peak somewhere. <laughs> if you can go anywhere as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you can just you can just transport yourself anywhere and just just be up there and be like, it's almost like Watchmen, isn't it? Like the Mister Manhattan, like can 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 do it all, be anything, but can't really feel anything. So, yeah. How do you get to those places? Do you fly, or do you have to just get on normal transport? No, you fly. Oh, <laughs> it's got to be real world though. If you could just fly anywhere. Oh, I didn't know if you. I thought you couldn't interact with anyone or anything. Yeah, I guess. I guess this is what this is what I meant by like the questions are like half formed. Do you know what I mean? So I, I learn more about the questions the more I ask, I ask them. So does that um, mean you have to be naked because you can't interact but... with clothes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think about that. That's so you're just I'm just naked. imagining being used in nothing. There's just like a void. Can anyone yeah. see you? Uh, yeah. Oh my god! Okay. So you're just a naked person. You can't even explain why you're naked. And you don't but have you can, to. But you can fly. <laughs> yeah. So you just be like a, everything, though. <laughs> <laughs> you just be avoiding everyone all the time, anyway, because you're naked. Yeah, but it's 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 also, it's almost like knowing that you're on. Un- you're untouchable. You're actually <laughs> like whatever whatever happens, just I don't know, turn up at the most inappropriate times. Think about it. Think about how you try to wield that power as well. Like, I don't know, like a G six summit and you're like, let's just let's just cause some havoc. And <laughs> let's just, just go, go to this yeah, to this summit and flash everyone <laughs> and then disappear. <laughs> You'd become be- sort of an icon, I guess. I reckon you know a, cult, I mean? a cult would follow you in future years. They'd write a book yeah. about you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Have you changed your mind now, Barney? Yeah, I think I'm I'm swaying. I hadn't quite gathered. I'd read it and not really thought, kind of taken in the anywhere bit. I'd just mm. taken in the... So that, yeah. Mm. If I could just sort of hang out and whiz around the world, going to interesting places then maybe maybe it yeah yeah can i can i switch you know yeah of course of course <laughs> like, you ain't got to live and die on these hills but i need to be good <laughs> it'd be sort of like because i'm it was like great to listen to you talk about anthropology tutorial because like, i i love anthropology it was during my gap year just a year out working in london that i realized that what i wanted to do had anthropological foundations in it and um I guess it's within the scope of this conversation. I'm looking at that. I'm thinking it could be an anthropologist's dream. Do you know what I'm saying? Just turn yeah. up somewhere, be be involved somewhat, just sl- slightly removed at a distance. Just you know what I'm saying? Just like taking yeah. it all in and and yeah, man. Observe. But did you just say your gap year was in London working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What that was a me. gap year! <laughs> <laughs> Chose. Chose. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it was more about inward exploration than outward exploration, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but but like in in the same breath, like met some people in that period of time that were really influential in terms of helping me grow up, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Just just little young 18, 19 year old boy needed to grow up and be in the real world. And I and I think it was exciting for me because I went to a boarding school as well. So, so sort of like coming back to London and experiencing it in sort of like formative years that that adulthood boundary was was good for me. Nice. Um, I've never heard of anyone doing a gap year working in London before. It's uh, ga- I, imagine if the rest of your life was like just going on holidays to lovely places, and then your gap year is just a year of working. <laughs> you, you are. <laughs> You are hitting real close to home right now, Victoria. You have no idea. You have no idea. Um, Say, Chloe, what topic are you picking? 
economy not that i know that much about economy mate you, you don't have to know anything about economy to answer these questions <laughs> okay great <laughs> yeah um actually i'll go can i go wild card or is it too early no nah, man wild cards wild cards are here yeah. for the win, man. um okay here's a wild card <laughs> okay <laughs> would you rather be an unimportant character in the last movie you saw or an un- unimportant character in the last book you read um i think an unimportant character in the last book i read the book's quite weird me and jazz uh, my partner we went to avebury where there's some stone circles bigger than stonehenge there's a bookshop there and a woman sold a, bu- a book to jazz you know like Jazz gets into these weird conversations with people and then bought a series of books that were about an archaeologist that goes back in time that digs up different things. Yeah, anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd want to be an unimportant character in that book. It's quite strange and unusual. Yeah. <laughs> dope, dope. I was just trying to remember the last movie I watched and I was like, I actually can't remember it. Just been watching loads of documentaries, man. Yeah, I've been watching, um, I'm obsessed with Australian Survivor at the minute, about like two competing islands and can they survive? I don't know, I've got niche tastes at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> are, they, are they celebrities? celebrities? No. Is it one of those, like no, a reality normal. TV show? It is a reality TV show, but it's like just normal people, like an ice cream man van that wants to win half a million pounds. Love yeah. that. You've got a dream, man, you've got a dream. <laughs> Amazing! All right, it's sick. Let's let's go. Let's go for another round, Victoria. Yeah. What, what topic would you like? Wild card. Go for a wild card, baby. <laughs> okay. The world is in the throes of a battle with a billionaire supervillain. You've been instructed by the resistance to put poison in a dessert of your choice. What dessert do you pick, and why? Oh, do you know what? I'm going to choose jelly because it's got oh. gelatine in it. And, like, I don't think there needs to be, like, dead animals in puddings. Like, mm. I just don't think there's any need for it. It's greedy. So um, I'll put all the poison in all the jelly. <laughs> 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 I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine the scale of that that work. Like, I was just asking you to defeat the supervillain himself. Why are we going to take out the whole team, man? I like just I'm, laced jelly shots for yeah, everyone. Yeah, I'll get everyone from PM Studio to uh, yeah, P- and to come and go to Sainsbury's and inject all the bird's eye jelly stuff with uh, poison. <laughs> <laughs> the, so thing real. Is, how, the thing is though how can we stop the uh public dying though because we only want to kill the super villain uh, yeah so i guess i guess i i had i had imagined it like you was you were part of the resistance working in and amongst his staff as a cell on the inside yes okay so i i'm a, a chef in the kitchen a cunning yeah. chef yeah, well then that's even even more dramatic because his jelly is, is a he. Sorry, the super villain. It's, it's always a he. Uh, so he will obviously love those big fancy jellies like they had in Victorian times that they put in like a big mould. And um, and I love the the comical um, visual of this like wibble wobble wibble wobble wibble wobble, <laughs> and then just like. Fall him falling down dead. It's just like <laughs> you know, oh. evil jelly. I like it. I'm here for it, man. Like <laughs> a, a giant jelly sculpture. That's that's gonna save the world. Yeah, I always knew I'd save the world somehow. <laughs> okay, Barney, we got you up next. Which which top pick would you like? Uh can I go for a wild card as well? Or have you yeah, got any left? We got we got some of them left. Okay. Every significant decision you make will be decided by a live audience or by rock, paper, scissors. 
Nice. Hmm. Uh, I'm gonna go with rock paper scissors. And yeah. <laughs> just keep it keep it random. Depends what the audience you get. <laughs> Look at it like jury service. So it's every decision is gonna be a random twelve random people get selected to, to make the decision for you. Yeah. Then you just have to make the best of of, of what you're what what you're given. <laughs> In, in both circumstances but i guess you're um, i'm sort of reading the question that as do you, do you trust people or do you trust yourself uh, oh, i don't know really i think i probably trust fate more than a group of <laughs> random people <laughs> <laughs> i think it'd be quite nice you could like because i'm quite an indecisive person or it takes me ages to make up a decision so if i had like a group of people that i could be like what do you reckon It'd be quite good. Yeah. And then he's just like, yep, that is it. I'll just take it. Just roll with it. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think it's, that's why I was careful to say significant decisions because I think <laughs> yeah. it'd, it'd just be a waste of time if you needed someone to help you pick your underwear in the morning. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, I read it as like literally every decision. <laughs> like, so, Bonnie, where did you land? Are you staying with rock, paper, scissors? Well, I think. It seems like all of my answers I'm now going maybe an you audience can stick would with be them. more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I need I need one of these things to help me make a decision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what you think? Yeah, the, the, your arguments for a live audience are quite appealing now, so I'll go I'll go with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. You Love that. Me. <laughs> Chloe. Yeah. What, what subject would you like? We'll, we'll go for uh, economy. Economy? We'll go for it, yeah. Compliments and positivity have replaced money. Would you survive? Uh, well, so you have to trade. Yep, everything in compliments. It'd be quite draining, the positivity I know, part. Right? Uh, I reckon... <laughs> I reckon I can give lots of compliments. Most yeah. people have something about them, don't they, that you can compliment quite easily. Um, but I True. think it would be the positivity. I'm generally quite neutral. Yeah. I think I would, I'd survive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've watched loads of seasons of Survivor. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got me thinking as well, like, what? what budgeting would be like on that currency. Do you know what I'm saying? How do you buy a car? How do you, yeah, man. Like, how do you buy a car? How do you make those kind of big investments? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you get a mortgage, bro? <laughs> Is there too much positivity? I don't know how to get a car with positivity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. oh, dear. I think I'll be all right, but I don't know about some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh good so is that so are you saying to survive in this situation you might have to break off some friends so you can make sure you're around enough people to... I, I may have to train them train them like, yeah. train them to be <laughs> fake and give compliments and stuff you know you've got a much better heart than I do man <laughs> you were like just get rid <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to survive <laughs> uh. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, man. I think about that question, I'm always just like, when it comes to compliments and positivity, like, where do they actually come from? Like, that whole thing of like, is a good deed something about self-gratification or is it actually about the sort of unrequited action? Do you know what I'm saying? Like something that you do without ever considering it being reciprocated at all. You know what I, mean? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, I like chatting to people, trying to be kind to them, just because it's, it's not like they get something from that i get something from that i don't mm. think there's any reason to be negative like to strangers so or this, anything in this world then chloe you're going to be super rich you're going to have yachts yeah. and everything and all the yeah. ones that can't do compliment compliments and that are negative are going to be the new poor yeah your, your friends will be your staff <laughs> what <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> or or Victoria, I could run a commune. 
<laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> nicer. <laughs> yeah. What about what about receiving compliments as well? Do you know what I'm uh, saying? Because like it's hard to receive compliments and and do you know what I'm saying? Like and believe them. And and yeah. that's part of being positive. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's also that sort of yeah. that inward part of it too. And and that's real interesting. I hadn't thought about that until just now. <laughs> yeah, I actually not great at taking compliments. So I could buy lots of stuff, but I couldn't sell it. Yeah, but yeah. that's Chloe's idea would be the commune. I'd be super rich and all my friends <laughs> would be my staff. <laughs> <laughs> buying out buying out all the jelly. Just, 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 getting hella rich and buying all the jelly and being like, yes, this is my this is my good deed to you. Like this is positivity. We had super villains being felled by jelly. We've got Chloe leading a commune for the neutrals and Barney living the life of the common people. This episode was pure warmth. So much time and love for our guests, Chloe, Victoria and Barney. Head to the Pervasive Media Studio website to check out their work or come through and learn more at a lunchtime talk every Friday at 1pm. As always, a massive thanks to The Watershed, the University of Bristol and the University of the West of England for supporting the project and to the PM Studio exec team. I want to take a moment to show some love to Joe Kimber as well, as they were instrumental in us being able to get the second series off the ground. Much love, Joe. Our beautiful artwork was created by Jazz Thompson, the music designed by Joe Hill. Remember to check us out on social media to share some of your responses. Tune in next time as we get to speak to some more of our beautiful community.